Chapter 77 Divorce and the Family Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 to 4 When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favour in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it in her hand, and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, after that she is defiled, for that is abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Deuteronomy chapter 24 Verses 1 to 4. Like so much in Deuteronomy, this is a controversial text. The modern mind misunderstands it and declares it to be anti feminist because it would appear that only the man can secure a divorce. That this is not true appears from Mark chapter 10, verse 12, where our Lord speaks of a woman divorcing her husband. Had his statement been contrary to the law, the Pharisees and scribes would have immediately called attention to this to discredit him. In the intertestamental period, it is true that many rabbis gave ridiculous reasons for divorcing a wife, that is, cooking and serving food too hot or too salty and so on and on. These trifling grounds reflect rabbinic pontifications to please people, not reality. Churchmen, on the other hand, insist on contrasting Matthew chapter 19 verses 3 to 9 with Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 to 4 and discrediting the Deuteronomic law. Again, if our Lord were stricter or looser in his teachings on divorce than the law, he would have been at once the target of an all-out attack and condemnation. In order to understand this law, we must recognize the strong familistic culture of the Bible. First, the dowry system was perhaps the major restraint upon divorce. No man could casually divorce a woman wrongfully and not thereby forfeit the considerable wealth of the dowry. It was somewhat easier for a woman to walk away from a marriage. Second, if the man wronged his wife, he not only lost the dowry he had provided, but he faced also the anger of his wife's family. The male members would be resentful of his faithlessness. In a familistic culture, it is very unwise to offend another family. Third, the divorce was not obtainable on his say-so. A council of tribal or clan elders would pass on the validity of his attempt to divorce his wife. This hearing would determine whether he or the wife retained the dowry. The elders at the gates of the city or town were the men who rendered the decisions in all such matters. The grounds for divorce were some uncleanness in her, verse 1, a term which covers more than sexual misconduct to include a generally evil character and an evil way of life. The free is to find no favour thus cannot be read in terms of arbitrary personal tastes. It refers to substantial problems. If the elders grant the divorce, whether favouring the man or the woman, a bill of divorcement had to be given by the husband to the wife. Again, this is important because it means that she has title to the diary, or possibly does not, because the guilt is hers. This bill of divorcement clarifies the marital and property status of the woman. It also establishes whether or not the woman also has the children because the guilty party could lose control of them. Having gained a divorce, whether winning or losing, the woman could then remarry. 
her guilt or innocence had been established. Her guilt did not prevent her from remarrying. Her second husband might well believe that she has mended her ways. Verse 3 then gives us certain possibilities for the woman. First, her second husband might hate her also, finding her a perverse and evil woman. Second, her second husband might die and leave her a widow. What then are her options? Verse 4 tells us that her first husband cannot remarry her. He might want to do so because, assuming her guilt, she is now a wealthy woman, and he wants to gain her assets, assuming that the dead husband had no heirs. On the other hand, she could be now a repentant and godly woman. Whatever the reason, remarriage is forbidden. The reason given is that she is defiled. The Hebrew word translated defiled means foul or contaminated. The bill of divorcement would specify the grounds for divorce. The man and woman were no longer a community of life. Marriage is a covenant and a contract. As such, it cannot be lightly entered into or lightly broken. There is a ban on attempts to renew it. Defilement and uncleanness are related concepts. The defilement is of two kinds, and these two are inseparable. First, one can be defiled in relationship to God. It is his law we transgress. Whether or not we understand what God means when he says we are defiled, we are defiled. We have crossed a boundary forbidden to us. Second, because we are defiled in God's sight, we should therefore see ourselves as defiled in the sight of men. Our obedience must rest not on understanding but on faithfulness. God ordains the marriage covenant and he sets the conditions thereof. We cannot go against his word without being defiled, self-defiled. A remarriage contrary to God's law, verse 4, is abomination before the Lord and it causes the land to sin. Because marriage is the most personal and closest of ties, Marital and sexual sins are especially deadly for a land and a culture. The grounds for divorce in this law did not include adultery nor homosexuality because both the husband and the wife gained the divorce by death from the guilty party. Treason against the family was the worst crime and in any society it is deadly. Modern life is not family-oriented, and so it is alien to the biblical doctrine of treason. In verse 1, the phrase, some uncleanness in her, can be rendered, something shameful in her. It is, however, literally, the nakedness of a thing. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, we are told, Where there is no vision, the people perish, or is made naked, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. The Hebrew words for naked or nakedness in Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 1 and Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 are not identical, but the meaning is similar. A people or persons who despise God's laws concerning marriage in the family are in a state approaching collapse. They are running wild or naked. They are evil and unashamed of it. Thus, what is here said to be the grounds for the dissolution of a marriage is a general lawlessness, not in the sense of criminal conduct, but in regard to God's requirements of men and women in marriage. In the kind of offence cited in verse 1 as nakedness, we have those things whereby a person shows his evil and ungodly nature. The very forms of godly living are set aside. A pattern of contempt for God and man appears. In such a case, the man seeks from the elders at the gate a dissolution of the marriage, and the wife of such an ungodly man, through her family, 
seeks an end to her bondage. This is not simply a divorce law. Modern anarchism will call it so, but it is more than that. It is family law. The major concern in a divorce is thus not merely the husband and the wife, but the husband, wife, children and the kinsfolk. We cannot superimpose our modern anarchistic individualism on biblical law. In our time, priority rests with the state and then the person. In a truly godly society, priority belongs to God and his law and, under him, the family. It is a tragic absurdity that modern discussions of divorce centre on the individual, and it tells us much about the modern age. In a divorce, those affected can include children, if there are any. It is commonly, and in other eras, always inclusive of families on both sides. We cannot limit the meaning of the word family to the husband, wife and children, the basic unit. It includes a network of lives and relationships. To limit our concern to divorce law thus falsifies the problem. Each man and woman has normally a family network which is either hurt or benefited by the divorce. Divorces occur but the family remains. A divorce can deliver a family from evil. Godly divorce is a deliverance from evil for the suffering person, the children and the relatives.